in her forthcoming book, Can You Just Sit With Me? Author Natasha Smith tells of her own grief journey. From the very start, she writes, On November 22, 1998, I flailed around my dorm room, unable to keep my footing as waves of confusion, shock, and anger crashed against the ship of my mind. Disbelief submerged me as I exhaled, unable to catch my breath. Angie died this morning. Those words rang out like a piercing megaphone in my ear, and in a shaky voice, I murmured, Wait, what happened now? Angie died this morning. I dropped the phone to the floor, tears racing down my face. Dazed and confused, my tears turned to sobs, and sobs turned to wails. Unable to hear my thoughts, it felt as if my brain shut down. After a moment, my vision cleared. My eyes burned as I stared into space. This can't be true. She's only 32. I prayed for God to heal her, and he promised. He promised me, I stammered. I had plans. We had plans. I hoped to see my sister a few days before Thanksgiving break. But it was too late. This is grief. She offers another grief story. In August of 2011, my sister Sharon called just a few short days after I visited her at home, after her emergency surgery to remove part of an intestine due to a blockage. Happy to hear her voice, the joy in my spirit turned to angst. My stomach knotted up and my muscles tensed as she spoke. The doctor diagnosed me with cancer, she said. I felt thrown into a dark tunnel. Her voice was muffled and I stopped breathing for what seemed the remainder of the conversation. I tried to remain calm and controlled. I stuffed my emotions down as I had learned to do over the years while she described what the doctor called a promising outlook. Weeks later, my niece Nicole called frantically. They're asking what to do, she said. What to do about what, I answered. Mom is unresponsive and they're asking me what to do. Her voice registered panic. My heart did too. I told myself to be calm. Tell them to do whatever they need to do to keep her alive, I told her. For weeks, we prayed, fasted, and lived at the hospital. After work, my niece and I alternated evenings at her bedside. I read healing scriptures over her, and the slightest signs of improvement nudged on our faith. The physical and occupational therapist were scheduled to begin. But then I received the call. The doctor said she's brain dead and the medical team needs the family to decide about life support, my niece said through tears. The hospital support staff encouraged us to say our last words to Sharon. No, she can't hear me anyway, I told the staff. To be honest, I didn't know what I was saying. I wanted to tell her everything, but forming words was hard. I said goodbye, but my heart reeled. Who dies only two months after a cancer diagnosis? Sharon was 42 when she took her last breath on this earth. This is grief. Grief is an emotion that wears many faces, much like strength. And in this conversation, our bonus episode with Tasha... We are going to talk about a biblical model that Tasha and her beautiful engineer mind has created for us a biblical model of grief. And I love the linear, beautiful way that she lays that out for us. So let's welcome Tasha back for this bonus episode in which she is going to share really practical tools that we are going to be able to put in our toolbox so that when grief knocks at our door, we will be ready.
Well, I know every one of our heartlifters has the story, you know, mm-hmm. and has, yeah. and I'm so, I'm really, once again, just grateful that you're here, Tasha, that you're willing to be vulnerable, that you're willing to open your heart and use your voice to help us. So what do we do? Yeah. What do we do when we do get that phone call, when we uh, receive news, you know, um, what do we do? Where does this process begin and how are you identifying this biblical grief model if you could explain that to us and perhaps enlighten us on where to go where to start mm-hmm. um i say start start at the feet of jesus yeah yeah i mean it sounds like mm-hmm. really you know but really yeah. it's not trite we don't do trite here and then we really are just taking a deep breath and really our our journey at least the one that I have been on through my wilderness wanderings in this global pandemic is I've really come to know, thank the Lord Mm -hmm. through lots of moments on this floor back here of Mm -hmm. weeping and wrestling with who are you really? Yes. Who are you, Jesus? Like I've heard thousands of sermons. I've taught thousands of Bible studies and sermons and blah, blah, blah. But now that all the trappings are gone, who the heck am I? Who is my faith? Mm -hmm. That's where we are. So this is not trite. We are saying you are, I can feel it. I see it on your face. It's start there, fall apart on the floor, pull the car over, do whatever. Okay. So we start at the feet of Jesus. Yes. Mm -hmm. And very then, grounding, by the way. Yeah. Um, and w- when we're looking, you know, in for the book, I bring in a lot of different biblical examples, you know, of Good. men and women who have grieved. But mm-hmm. when, and even Job, you know. Um, yes. Yeah. But when I really, truly thought, like, who is the ultimate example? I'm going to always go back to Jesus. Because yeah. Jesus is our ultimate example. And I thought about the WWJD bracelets. Yes. What Jesus to do? I'm like, I need to get like some t-shirts. Yes. Somebody, you know, what would Jesus do? So I'm thinking like, what did Jesus do? And so that is kind of what, how I base this biblical grief model is, is based after what Jesus did when we take a look at him and what he did as he grieved, you know, Lazarus, as he grieved over John 11, John the yeah. Baptist. Yeah, you know, and so and that's where this biblical grief model comes from. So t- walk us through that. He wept. He He wept. He Absolutely, he wept. I love, I love that. Shortest scripture in the in the whole Bible. Right, Jesus wept. The right, first, the first scripture I learned in in Sunday school was Jesus yes. wept. <laughs> exactly, sword drills. Uh, right. Yes, and so just again, gr- grief needs a place to go. It's okay with expressing our grief. We're not crazy. Grief is normal. We know this, um, but um, showing emotion. So you know, Jesus invites us and helps us to know that it's okay to cry. It's okay to express emotion. So Jesus wept. And then he went off to um, a quiet place. He did. Thank you for bringing that out. Yes. He took the time. Yeah. Because you write about that. Mm -hmm. You know, repression comes by like, I just was saying busyness, just filling in all the quiet places. So you don't have to hear anything. When you sit, your mind starts going. Yeah. So I avoided sitting or being yeah. quiet for decades and then had to train myself in that practice to learn how to hold my thoughts, capture my thoughts and do all that. So, right. So he took the time, created the space. Mm-hmm. Is that what I'm hearing? That's yes, absolutely. Made I it a priority. That. Right. I love what you said, because looking back, I realized that busy was the thing, my go-to yeah. thing. I mean, even in college, because I experienced that loss with my sister in college, I had like three, four jobs in college for no real reason. You know, you just wanted to keep busy. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Now you can reflect back. I certainly, exactly. Lord have mercy, how I have yeah. used workaholism to avoid mm-hmm. my looking at my soul, looking right. and doing that soul work. And, you know, and Jesus knew the plan, like he knew the plan, right? He knew the delay that was going to happen with Lazarus, but 
he was overcome. That's what I've learned in that story. He was so overwhelmed because he loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha so much. They were his intimates. He stayed at their house in Bethany, right? That was where that was where he had someone to sit with him. That's how I read that story. Yes. You know, can someone just sit with me? Oh, I know Mary, Martha, and Lazarus will sit with me. Oh, mm-hmm. I think that because I always say I just want to be that house where Jesus yeah. would want to come. Yeah. Yes. And just sit. And so I could just sit with him yeah. and hold space. We call that holding space here. It's mm-hmm. so hard to hold space True. with people because it takes time, energy, right. and it takes it away from what we think is important. Right. Or what is valuable in culture, right? Yeah, absolutely. What's what we think is valuable in culture is a huge thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because we value productivity above all things. Absolutely. You know? What'd you do today? Well, I sat with her mm. for four hours. What did you get done? Well, I sat <laughs> with my friend yeah. for mm. four hours. We don't value presence. Oof. And you're helping us do that. Okay. So the biblical model, I really want to walk through it. Yeah. Is that in a certain chapter? Because I'm not privy to the book. So this is in the chapter healing paths. Chapter 12. Let me read this. This was on, okay. um, you, you wrote this and I, I think it is mm-hmm. so powerful. Culture influences the way we grieve. This is what you're inviting us into really looking in our own lives Mm -hmm. on how we make time, energy, and space for our souls. Yeah. Okay. We live in a fast paced culture that cares about making the world go round and not about how you feel. Oh, I love you. In our culture, there is no time to grieve. Maybe the way our culture brushes over loss and grief causes us to fear how we respond to grief. Yes. I've been in groups where someone became visibly upset with tears and you could tangibly feel the discomfort in the room. God has given you such insight. Tears or emotions are often unwelcome in most environments. Just think about what is presented across social media, especially. We're inundated with images of happy-go-lucky faces, pretty pictures, and perfectly manicured square spaces, void of any resemblance to the reality of the grief-filled world in which we live. These pictures almost force you to wear a smile, Mm. regardless of your circumstances, your hurt, and your grief. They almost force you to hide your grief. And the most profound thing I read that you wrote is, hold on. Right here. Tears are important to God. Yeah. They tell stories we can't imagine. Okay. So making the time, the energy and space, Jesus wept. He took the time and he went away. Continue on with this beautiful yes. model. Yeah. So Jesus went away. He made space for grief. He cried. He cried. He showed emotion. And then Jesus asked questions. Ah, tell us. So he's in the garden. Why have you forsaken me? It gives us permission to ask questions depending on where, how you grew up, you know, what, you know, if you have a certain church affiliation or whatever, Mm -hmm. just or culture, you you may not feel like you can go to God, go to Jesus Mm -hmm. to say, I don't know about this. Yeah. Yeah. why, why are you letting me, this hurt me? You yeah, know, this really sucks. Yeah, exactly. Right, sucks. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to use that word. <laughs> oh yeah. But you know, it, and it hurts me that people, that we, we have felt like that, mm-hmm. to, that we can't come to the one who, who loves us the most and created us mm-hmm. to say this. I don't like this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I have questions. The thing is, the thing, but the thing I found is, you know, we have questions. We we need to go to the one who has the answers, yes. who is the truth, and he has all the truth and all the answers in this biblical grief model. It's 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 saying it's okay. Jesus has had questions, and we can have questions too because we can go to our Father who has all the answers. Yeah, and He actually said, "Take it away from me." <laughs> right. I don't want to do this. Yeah. Okay. I'm done. This yeah. Is, I'm good. Yeah. 
I mean, to me, that is the most wonderful permission, you know? I mean, he had had a practice of setting aside time in solitude and silence to realign himself with his father. So I think that's an, a critical point as well as we need to have this practice in yes. our lives of collecting strength, of going to the father, of not just when the loss happens, yes. when the trauma hits, because these are all traumas in your life right. for sure. Yeah. You've had yeah. so much trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, and even with a practice in place in the garden, he was like, you need to take this away from me. It's a bit much. Right. It's a bit much. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He moved through that. Mm -hmm. So make time, energy, and space. This mm -hmm. is so critical to have. He gave himself the permission yeah. to take the time, energy, and space. And yeah. he had the world's traumas on his shoulder. Right. He had the the whole responsibility of making things right in this world, right? And yet he took that time and made time and gave himself permission. Yeah. Also, he asked questions. And I think, Tasha, affirm me or correct me. That's because he really knew the father's love for him. Yes. Is that true? It is. Absolutely. The belief in our depths that... He loves us so much mm -hmm. that no question we bring to him is going to rock his boat, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I talk about that earlier on in the book because we okay. have, you have to establish that you have to yeah. establish that he loves, he loves us. Okay. So exactly what you're saying. Like I, I established that earlier on in the book because that's, What's going to carry us through this? What do you give us then? Add to my conversation. Like we're not privy to the book yet. We'll have you back when yeah. this book comes out. And I'm actually holding a tangible copy if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, please. But from that introduction, it, what do you bring to us to understand and receive the love of God? How, how can we perhaps make some movement towards that? Mm -hmm. Not just a head knowledge. Yeah. Because we say the longest journey is from our head to our heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And embodying, like, oh, I know and believe God loves me. Was in um, like a mentorship type group. It was really kind of like a business group, but it has mm -hmm. like some spiritual notes to it or something. And yeah. um, the mentor had us, it, it was interesting. And I feel like it was a God thing, but she brought up like people who had trauma experienced trauma in their lives mm. and she had us do this exercise to say you know think back on you know a particular time where where you question where god was like god where were you mm -hmm. and so it's like okay mm -hmm. you know i'll try it <laughs> which one shall i choose <laughs> exactly on my timeline of grief yes <laughs> but you know what i did it and it brought me to my knees. God literally, literally showed me every time where he was. Oh, wow. In a sense. And it's it's not like, you know, I go back, you know, in my mind and think of, you know, uh, emergency room or mm -hmm. uh, a hospital room and mm -hmm. an angel appeared. It's not that. It's yes. I had a peace in some of these situations. Shouldn't have had it. Shouldn't have had it. Mm-mm. No, like God showed up not, though. Mm -hmm. God showed up or had this comp this overwhelming comfort that um that felt as heavy as like my my grandma my mom quilt. So like that heavy quilt. Oh yeah, nice beautiful quilt. Love it. These are ex tangible experiences that I had that no one can talk me would ever be able to talk me out of. I got it. And so it's a know that I know that God is his presence, his, his peace, his comfort in these mm -hmm. times mm -hmm. are real. And they're not just available to me. Yes. They are available to everyone. Well, can we pause and make this yeah. available to our yeah. heart lifters today? Yes. If you wouldn't mind, perhaps inviting, mm -hmm. just like that mentor invited you, would you mind inviting our heart lifters here to pause, take a break. Yeah. And think about a time 
in their life. Mm. Exactly what she did. I'd love if you wouldn't mind doing that. Yes. I love your voice. Your voice makes yeah. me calm. So right now, mm-hmm, every right now. Heart, right now, every heart lifter who is listening, just take a moment. Just take a moment and pause, stop what you're doing, and just think about a time yeah. where you felt that God was not there. Mm-hmm. Just recall a time or moment. And I want you to to ask him, God, where were you? Show me where you were. And just sit for a moment and trust and believe that he will show you. Yeah. Because God is an ever present help Mm -hmm. in times of trouble. In times of trouble, amen, yes, he is. Okay, heartlifters. I guess you're back from our pause. (laughs) And remember, tears are important to God. Tasha taught us that. They tell stories we can't imagine. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of taking the time, the energy and the space to find a quiet place like Jesus did to align with your father and open up your heart. Was that difficult for you? Tasha, did you go find a quiet place? Were you just driving in your car? Maybe help fashion in our minds the imagery of that. That might be helpful. Yes, I was I was at, at home. And so I just um, came to my bedroom, you know, closed the door and did exactly that. Just literally made space because as we mentioned, I have kids, you know. You do, and, four, and, and they're home. Me. Yeah. And, and so, um, I, but I, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to, quote unquote, try this. And, but literally changed, uh, it, it made a huge impact on me knowing that my father, God, ha- he's always with us. He was always with me in every mm-hmm. single thing. Create a scenario perhaps, or a picture of what we think that help would look yeah, like. Exactly. Oh, you know, Jesus knew what it looked like. He knew he had to go to the cross Yet he still said, take this from me. So I think at least in my life, I'm very visual and I can picture ways I thought God's Mm -hmm. help would look like. Absolutely. But you have to surrender that Mm -hmm. because it rarely looks like how I imagine It's, it's for me, it was going through it. Going through the trauma, the trial, the experience, the journey. And the help showed up in the form of a cardinal or two chaplains at a hospital door or Mm -hmm. signs on the hospital wall Mm -hmm. or a janitor, as Mm -hmm. I opened up, came out of the elevator. I mean, these ways that God just showed up Mm -hmm. the name of a doctor that I had that meant faith and light. You know, it's just like, what? Yes. Just those little glimpses of hope. And and that's what you say. Cling, cling to hope. Yes, I love what I love that how how you just brought that out because we said our we don't talk about it. I don't think enough mm-hmm. right. in the in the vein of a lot of times our expe- expectation temper mm-hmm. what God is trying to show us in how oh, that's he's good expectations temper the way God is trying to show us. That's so powerful. Yeah, expectations. Hmm. We're going to dive into that one down, down the road (laughs) because it's, it's about, because expect expectation, actually, when you take it apart and you look at it and it's, you know, the transliteration of it, whatever, actually way down deep means a miscarriage of a dream or a miscarriage of an image or something. So it's absolutely that it's like, we have this picture we are pregnant with this picture. This is how God's going to help me. Or this is how I'm telling God to help me. Yes. Wow. That's because he's got a different plan. Yes. And Jesus had to go through it. Yeah. So I believe at the moment when he was finally gut, you know, gut level honest with his father, where he imaged to us that the endowment of what he needed to endure and get through that happened. Mm. That's my, my philosophy, my, my thoughts. Wow. This, 
is so good. Let me read this and we're going to have to close because I have to honor your time, dear one. We often see tears and immediately attempt to interpret them. When we see someone crying, our natural response is to ask what's wrong. Tears can mean an array of emotions, including sadness, joy, or even anger. Your tears may simply express the hurt you feel at the reality of your loss. When I think of tears, Tasha says, I think of the way water flows from a faucet. The water's pressurized, waiting for the water to be released. And it is the same with our emotions and our tears. Often something acts as a blocking valve, holding us back. I love the engineer in you. (laughs) I love this. I love the engineer in you. Holding us back and holding tears in. But when we feel safe, when we feel we have permission, we finally let them flow. So Tasha, I cannot leave without asking for your help in ways that we can be the safe person. I I know that you cover this. What can we do now to respond to your question? Can you just sit with me? Okay, I'm going to go sit with someone. How can I be of use? How can I be a blessing? How can I hold their tears? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, I think listening is one of the most underrated Mm-hmm. activities that one can do when we're sitting with someone else. And and what does that look like? It could be it could be asking a question like, you know, so how are you feeling right yeah, now? Today, where's your heart? Yeah. Yeah, yeah how's your heart? Mm-hmm. You know, and just allowing them to really express themselves, not definitely do not bring up your own story or interject and thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes. It's yeah. not the time. I know that I've done that in the past to try to relate. Yes, yeah, same. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. But what you're saying to us, and I, I, I think this is the most important takeaway, is to provide empathy. Yes. With perhaps your nonverbals or just, yeah. a, you know, a gift that you might bring or some fresh blueberry muffins or flowers or just anything, just your presence. But so what you and I are trying to do is is create this bridge between our faith and mental health and well-being yeah. and grief. And so if they say, oh, I'm fine, it's going to be fine. I mean, so-and-so has it so much worse. Like I hear that a lot. You know, this is just, this is just breast cancer, but you know, they're literally dying and they're going to be dead in three days. Like I hear people tell other yes. people's yes. stories or yes. minimize their story. So I think I hear you like lean in. And if someone says that, oh, it's fine. So-and-so has it worse. How would you offer them hope there? Or how would you lean in and perhaps speak? Mm-hmm. I actually have an example of my I would neighbor. love that. Okay. So my neighbor, I noticed that they had a, um, uh, like a funeral wreath um, on their porch. They they're, were really new, kind of new neighbors to us. So I hadn't really met them. But as right. soon as I saw that the funeral um, flower on the reef, I was like, oh my gosh, somebody, somebody's died. Yeah. And so I felt so, you know, compelled oh, to no. at least stop by. And so I just went to the grocery store oh. um, and just grabbed some different things. So I go across the street and I ring the doorbell and I was like, hi, you know, hey, you know, I'm Natasha across the street and I just I saw the flower and I wanted to bring you guys some things over but this is what she said Mm -hmm. she says it was my mom you know she had been in hospice for a long long time you know my mom passed away but you know my mom passed away but she she'd been in hospice for a long time almost making it almost like a a nonchalant thing and because she was old because Mm -hmm. she had been in hospice then almost like I Not that it's okay, but like she couldn't grieve. And so in that moment, I said, you know, it doesn't really matter how old she was and that she was in hospital, you know, that still, still hurt can hurt, you know? Yeah. And the loss of a mother, like as I found out, I mean, my mom was 93. Yeah. And it was like, you know, well, she lived a good life. She was 93. She's been, you know, she's been so ill for, no, 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 no. And I mean, I had a very complicated relationship with my mom. So then grief was complicated. Yeah. And even more grief that she finally died. Like there's survivor grief, like, you know, 
grief that, oh, I don't have to take care of her anymore. But then there's right. grief that you feel yeah. that way. As you yeah. know, grief is just yeah. like the peeling away at an onion. So yeah. I would have, if you had shown up at my door with that, right after my mama died and I was dealing with 5 million layers, I probably would have wept. Yeah. I probably just would have, you would have made me feel mm. safe. And I would have just said, get in this house and sit down. <laughs> <laughs> The funny thing is I could, I could tell that her, you know, almost like her shoulders dropped some. Oh yeah. Yeah. You gave her permission maybe. Yeah. yeah. You know, I didn't, I didn't push it because again, I, I didn't right. know, you know just me and her, but I pray that she did feel like, you know, that's so true. You know, I pray that it did yeah. give her some, some permission because, you know, again, it's like culture around us. It's like, oh, you know, because of this, because of this, I need to just go on with that, you know, get on, giddy up, Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mm -hmm. get on with it, move on. You know, we're not Victorian where we, you know, we grieve for a year and keep the casket in the house. I mean, their, their practices were extremely (laughs) different than ours, but other countries do. There are other countries in the world that make a lot of space for grief. Right. And so I just, I really do thank you from the deepest part of my heart for giving me permission to keep, you know, maybe deal with some unprocessed grief. I mean, that's what I felt when I was looking and preparing. I was like, Ooh, I think I have some unprocessed grief here that I need to make some more time, energy, and space for, especially over some losses in my life. Even like you said, career losses, you know, for me, Oh, the book's not selling well. I mean, there's so many times where we grieve over our work, the hands, or, you know, we've poured ourselves into our children and that's not going so well right now. I mean, that's a grief. Mama's grief is hard and deep. It's true. So I invite you back when this book is in our hands so we can give it a second push and we can learn more from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janelle. This has been such a blessing to me and just an honor to sit with you. This has been awesome. You can sit with me anytime. (laughs) Thanks for listening today. It was great having you here. For even more great content and resources, please join the Stronger Every Day online community at JanelleRairdon.com. Always remember, you, my friend, have value, worth, and dignity.